Okay, so what I want to talk about is trees, but not the, the green trees you see here. I want to talk about value trees. So basically structs within structs within structs in Swift. But the story doesn't begin with Swift. The story actually begins about two years ago in Objective-C. Two years ago, I joined the Sketch team, the Sketch app team. If you know um, Sketch, a lot of people are using it. I think, uh, I think most people here would, should know Sketch. Uh, basically a vector graphics program. And it's, uh, it's been around for a while, so it's all Objective-C. There's no Swift in, in, uh, in Sketch. But when I was brought in, I was tasked with basically refactoring the model layer of Sketch. So uh, not the, the UI that you all see, but actually how it works internally. And the way the Sketch model works is it's a, a tree, right? So each document in the, in the, is, is a tree with, um, with a root and then other layers and colors and blurs and things. Each, each node is basically one layer or one, one blur or something like that. So you can imagine a picture like this on the right uh, would be represented by a tree, the tree on the left. Each circle might be on a different layer, the diamond might be on a different layer, and the background is right at the root. So you basically render from the, from the root down the tree. So this is how it, how it was when I got there. And uh, these trees can be pretty big, gigabytes big. And so they had a few problems. One of the problems was, what happens when someone tries to edit one of these trees halfway through saving, right? So saving this tree, like I said, it could be big, could take a few seconds. And someone might change something when it happens. Is it going to crash? Is, it, is, the, is the save data corrupt? What, what should happen there? The same thing with rendering. Rendering, you, know, you might think, is really fast, but if you've got something like a, a background blur, that can be really expensive, and that can, can even take seconds long. And so again, what happens when, when someone's tweaking the, the inspector when that render's happening? Do you get something, some rubbish on the screen, or does it crash the app, or what, what happens there? And the last problem I had was a little bit unrelated to that. Uh, it was undo was quite fragile. If you've ever used uh, NS Undo Manager, basically the way it works is it just records all the changes, in time, and when you want to undo, you play the changes backwards. Now, that, that's OK for simple apps, but something like Sketch, uh, it was really a problem, because you only need one link in that chain to break, and the whole undo history is uh, basically kadook. Right? So there were three basic problems they had with these trees, and they, these were the ones that, we, that I was sort of tasked with trying to fix. And the solution we came up with was immutable trees, right? like these redwoods. So the idea was that the, the user would be editing this, this uh, mutable tree on the main thread. This left on the left here is our mutable tree. And whenever we want to do a render or a save or something that requires access to the whole tree, we make a snapshot. And then so that we can take, make a snapshot. It's immutable. It doesn't change after that. And we pass that off to the renderer, or we pass it off to the, the saver or the loader, whatever. So yeah, so it's just a, a, a mutable tree coupled with an immutable tree. And as a nice little side effect of this, we introduced a new undo system. Because now we've got these snapshots. And we, if what, what you can do is you can just keep the snapshots. right? And then you've got a history, just like Git. right? This works very like Git. So if you keep each of these snapshots, these immutable snapshots, Undo just becomes a case of stepping back to the last tree, or stepping back 10 trees, or whatever you want. And it's extremely stable, because it's very unlikely that these trees are corrupted anyway. You don't have to play back all the, every little change that led to the, to the current tree. You just simply go back to the last tree. So this was a great solution for, for Sketch, and uh, they're still using it now, I think. Uh, one more thing about that. I, I can imagine that people see that, and they, th they think, uh, OK, what if so? someone's made, make an edit to the, to the mutable tree, we're going to generate a whole new immutable tree. Isn't this going to become huge? If we're making a new immutable tree every time someone makes an edit, isn't that going to be a lot of data? It would be if you did that. But one nice thing is you don't really have to do that. You don't have to make a completely new immutable tree every time. So take this mutable tree here, this simple, this simple mutable tree, and imagine someone edits that bottom left node. What do we have to discard and what can we keep? Well, you have to discard the actual edited node and you have to discard its parent and the parent of that. Basically, uh, that all has to be re-rendered. Re but, but you really only have to discard the nodes in a path through the tree. So from the edited node up to the root, up to the ancestral root. 
and the rest of the tree can be left. All the subtrees, the rest of the subtrees are fine. They are unchanged by the edit. So you can see in this case, we can just throw away those three blue ones and keep the rest. And in a, a really big tree, uh, the difference between just a single path through the tree and, an, and, the, and the whole tree is enormous. So what you end up with is something more like this. So version one of the tree is this yellow, and then version two of the tree is three new nodes, and then the rest are shared with the old tree. So you never, you never actually have to make a full immutable tree except the first time, and then after that it's just these paths that change. So this actually works fine. So I left Sketch, uh, moved on, and I started a new project about six months ago with a friend of mine. And the nice thing about a new project is, of course, you can use Swift, right? Uh, you can try out those new fancy uh, value types and things like that. And so that's exactly what we decided to do. We thought, let's try and use structs for our model in this new app. And this new app was, uh, it, well, is uh, basically a, t a text editor. It's got text editing components. Won't go into detail exactly what it is, but it's got a lot of text. And of course, I think everyone here should know what the advantages and disadvantages are of, of value types. But just very quickly, why would we, would we be attracted to value types? Um, they're usually on stack memory, which, which is faster than heap memory, because you don't have the allocate and deallocate, which is very slow. You don't have to do garbage collection or reference counting or anything. Basically, objects or uh, values come and go as the stack pointer moves up and down. So it's very fast in that sense as well. Maybe even more attractive to me than just the performance is the safety. So you can, when you, whenever you give a value type to a function or you give a value type to another thread, it makes a copy of the value type. And that means that when you're working on that data, you don't have to be worried about data contention. Uh, you've basically got a private copy of the data. And that um, that's really, really helps when you're reasoning about data, but also just in terms of crashes and things. It's, it's, it's very unlikely that the two things will try to change the same data at the same time. So these are, these are what make value types attractive. And we came up with sort of this type of tree structure. It's, it's a value tree. So you've got at the top, you've got a document uh, struct. And it's got an array of sections. And then each section has an array of paragraphs. And then each paragraph, of course, has a string plus some styling information. Right? So this is a simple, obviously a simplified model from the actual app. But you get the idea. It's a tree. It's, a, it's a basically a tree of structs. And this was working OK, but uh, you know, I, I was still getting used to it because I come from the Objective-C world, where everything's an object, and uh, things are a little bit different. And one day, I was working with this code, and I had a bit of an epiphany. So I had uh, a view controller, and it had a document. And I had a did set block. And the idea, of course, was that if someone said self.document equals new document, that you'd probably want to reload all of you. So, so that was the idea. But then some other place in the code, I decided, OK, I need to set the style of this paragraph deep in the tree. Not, not the document itself, but something deep in the, in the tree, uh, the paragraph style. And to my surprise, when I did that, did set fired here for the, for the document. And as an Objective-C programmer, that confused me a little, a little bit at, 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 to begin with, because I, I expected that the did set will only fire if you say self.document equals. But it actually fires if you make any change to any part of the tree at all. And that, when I thought about it, initially I thought it was a bug, and then when I thought about it more, no, that makes total sense, because this is a value. It's atomic. If you change any part of the value, any part of the document, you're changing the whole value of the document. So this is actually a feature, not a bug. But this is sort of when it clicked uh, for me a little bit with uh, value types. And it also took me back to Sketch. And I thought, hang on, that's exactly what we were doing back at Sketch. right? What happens when you edit a node deep down in the document is it invalidates effectively all the nodes up to the root. Effectively, all fire did, did set. And so it's exactly the same model. We, we, we were doing it in Objective-C basically mimicking value types in, in, uh, in Sketch. And it's basically this exact same model. So this got, got me to thinking, OK, so there's two major projects I've worked on in two years, big apps, 
and they both eventually effectively end up at the same data model uh, design, right? So it, it started to look like a recurring problem, a recurring, recurring, should I say, recurring solution. And I, I started to wonder that whether it could be used in, in general, if this could be a sort of a, a general approach to modeling of apps, app data. And could you, for example, make a value store, something like core data, based around trees? Instead of modeling things with the core data modeler and making a graph of, of entities and relationships, what if you tried from the start just to think in terms of, of value trees and just had your model completely composed out of value trees? Uh, and of course, if you're going to do that, you don't want to have to then put it all in core data, you sort of move it into core data. So you, could we have a value store that actually does that? Right? Uh, you, you work with trees of data, of, of structs, and then it automatically gets uh, saved to disk. And while we're at it, since it's a modern framework that we're talking about, it should sync from day one, right? So if you, if you put a tree of data on one device, it should sync across, or sync to the cloud and then down to another device. Right, so a modern store based entirely on values. And so I came up with a concept, at least in my mind, a distributed value store. And what I was thinking of was things like Git, right, distributed version control systems, DVCS. And what I wanted was basically Git for value types. I can put structs in on one device, push them to a server, and pull them down to other devices. And so I started uh, look, thinking about that. OK, you could have a repository. A repository would be like a store, a persistent store in core data, for example. Uh, I'll call it a repository because I want to really emphasize this, this idea that it's, it's a bit like Git. You put your person struct in there. You've got, for example, a cloud server of some sort. It could be, could be anything, uh, in this case, cl cloud kit. And push the person gets pushed up to the cloud and, of course, then pulled down to another device. So a distributed value store. And so I started working on it just before, before Christmas, and I've been working on it for about six weeks, so it's very, very experimental. Um, but it, it seems to be doable. And so I'm, I'm, I'm releasing this as open source today, mental faculty uh, slash Impala on GitHub. So Impala, if you don't know what an Impala is, it's, a, it's like a propeller but it pumps fluid around in, a, in an engine, for example. Uh, and so uh, that's sort of how I think about this, this framework. It pumps your data around uh, the internet and around between devices and whatnot. So yeah, it's, it's like I said, very experimental. Please don't try to build your next uh, production app on this uh, at this point. But um, if you want to take a look, by all means do. Just to give you a quick look of, uh, at what I actually, how it actually sort of works in, in code, um, here's your person. The idea is you make it storable, so you, you comply to um, uh, the storable protocol. And that requires a couple of things. You have to, you have to give it a stored type static, uh, static string, usually just the same name as the, as the struct, in this case person. And you have to have a, a property that can be used to store metadata. And the metadata I'm talking about here is, for example, the, the identifier, uh, of, the, uh, of the value in, in the database, um, the version number, because it's all going to be syncing, and we have to control versions and uh, timestamps and things like that. So it's basically an opaque type, pretty much, uh, used by Impeller to do all the syncing and detect conflicts and things like that. Yeah, the rest of the struct is pretty much just, um, as you would normally do it. You just can make a uh, properties, name, age, for example, it can be optional. And then the other part of the storable protocol is this sort of um, encoding and decoding. And so if you've ever used NS coding before, uh, there's always an encoding method and a, and a decoding method. And that's basically what you have to provide here. You have to tell it how to, you've got an initializer that will take a repository and put the, the data into properties. And you've got the opposite as well. You've got a write method that takes the properties and puts them into the, into the repository. And that's it. So it's not really that complicated. There's two slides there, maybe 20 lines at most. Um, and that's pretty much it. To, that's pretty much all there is to it. And you've got a syncing, uh, a syncing store. 
So that's all I've got time for. Uh, I would say go and have a look at Impala if you want to. If you don't want to, at least take on board that this is an interesting design pattern, this, this tree-based tree value types. And think about it. Next time you're doing a project, think about, can I construct it in terms of value trees and, uh, and see how that goes? And uh, yeah, so go out there and, and get planting. Thanks.